I better get I'm so glad that we have the opportunity to gather together in his house today. Church family, do something for me real quick. Would you join me? Not yet. In a moment, would you join me in welcoming those who are here for the very first time? Now, there you go. If that's you, we're so glad that you're here. We welcome you to the services, and we're grateful for the privilege of worshiping with you today. And if you'll do something for us, pull out that bulletin you received on your way in and the uh, whatever device you brought in, iPhone, tablet, whatever, scan that QR code that says new here, and uh, let us know that you're here with us today. Give us a little bit of information about yourself. We'd so appreciate the opportunity to know that you are with us. And if you're watching online or by TV20, thanks for tuning in today, and if you're in the area, area, your local, come on out, be with us in person. We would love the opportunity to meet you and to worship along with you. Well, this coming week, we have, as you see behind me, Spark Studios VBS starts this week, actually tomorrow. So we are excited for all of the opportunities that we're going to have. We have over 400 children that are going to be here for VBS this week. So this is what we need, church family. We need prayer. We want you to join us in prayer for these kids and for the opportunity that they are going to have to hear the gospel. So you can download online uh, a prayer guide that you can join together. So many of you have already done this, and we uh, would love for more of you, all of you, to join us in praying for uh, those who are going to be at VBS. So. Go ahead and do that and commit to praying each day. And if you are a volunteer at VBS, we can't wait to see you tomorrow morning. Also, we have a very special group that's with us. Today is Father's Day. And so would you celebrate all of the dads that are in the room this morning? We celebrate you. We honor you. We thank you for being with us this day. And uh, we're going to take the opportunity to pray with you and for you a little bit later in our service. Well, now we have the privilege of witnessing believers' baptism. And so here's what's going to happen. If you're on one of these sides, you have a great view of the baptistry. If you're in the center, you can't see over this massive guitar, but we're going to put it up here on the screen. So hopefully you'll be able to see. But why don't we celebrate this one coming forward with a testimony of Believer's Baptism. Hello, church family. It is my privilege and joy to have um, Hunter Williams and his father, Blake Williams, here. He's going to be baptizing him. But I want to introduce him. He is a second grader, just finished second grade, going into third at FCA. He's got family and friends here to celebrate his baptism. But uh, um, could everybody please stand in honor of his baptism today? So dad's going to baptize him. Blake, do you believe that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life? He died on the cross for your sin. (laughs) Hunter, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose from the dead, and is alive today? Upon this profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in his likeness to death and raised in newness of life. Amen. <laughs> Y'all awake this morning? Yeah. All right. Hey, if you're with me, say, I'm with you. Okay, I need more participation than one. Or if you're with me, say, I'm with you. All right, here we go, y'all. Let's worship the Lord this morning as we sing together. Cry. Let's sing it out. Go on and speak again. Go on and speak against my borrowed innocence. The judge of my defense, I'm going free. Right when the gavel fell, I heard the freedom bell ring through the heart of hell. I'm going free. I'm going free. Glory, glory, hallelujah, you threw my shackles in the sea. Glory, glory, hallelujah, Jesus is my liberty, I'm going free. Now I won't go back again, that's just not who I am, Lord, I'm a brand. And oh, it's gonna lead me home. I'm going free. I'm going free. Yeah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. You threw my shackles in the sea. Glory, glory, hallelujah. 
John chapter 14, we read, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus Christ spoke these words, and he is the great way maker. God loves to wake and make a way when there is no way. He's, has he made something out of nothing in your life? Have you found a door from him when, when there was none before? How often have you found the, at the end of yourself, there's more of him. Jesus Christ is always there for us. So whatever sea stands in front of you today, whatever door seems closed, whatever grave seems sealed, know that in Christ, our God can make a way. It may, may not always be the way that you wanted. It may not be a way that you would have chosen. It may feel like a valley or a wilderness or a cross. But if we truly trust God and believe in Him, then He will surely make a way back to Him. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. Sing with, sing with me. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart, I worship 
stop working you never stop you never stop sing it out now even when i don't see as you're working even when i don't feel as you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see as you're working even when i don't feel as you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper Light in the darkness darkness my god that is who you are yes you are the way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are the way maker miracle worker Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, 
That is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Oh, praise the name of our God, our great waymaker and promise keeper. He is always faithful. Amen. So what does it mean to be a dad? I mean, at its core, what does it mean to be the best dad you can be? I mean, a dad's dad. Found you. Sometimes being a dad means you play hide and seek before breakfast. You're so easy to find. Maybe because I'm three times your size. <laughs> you know, there's more to being a dad than grabbing a mini ran and wearing socks and sandals and telling bad jokes. Don't talk with your mouth full. Hey, I taught you that. Go wake up your brother, would you? You know, being a dad isn't easy. It's like being under a constant job evaluation with managers who are much, much shorter than you. So we should strive to be the best dad we can be, because being a dad is a gift and a privilege. It's not an inconvenience or a burden. Now, lawn care, that's a burden. So let me tell you some things I've learned along the way. Ryan, it's time to get up, buddy. Kids need you to be present. They spell love, T-I-M-E. If you get a chance to jump on the trampoline, go jump on the trampoline. It's not gonna kill you. Um, probably. Be your kid's biggest encouragement. I love to catch my kids doing something great, and I love to be intentional about letting them know that I noticed. And here's another one. Love when it isn't easy. Excuse me. Excuse me. And even when they're being annoying, I try to be slow to anger. Do I do it perfectly? You bet I do not. Not even close. That's why it's important they're not number one. Right, champ? Mm. He's still asleep. It needs to be obvious that my relationship with God comes first. And through that relationship, I can gain wisdom and strength and perspective. So don't sweat it. We all mess up. I know I've messed up a lot, and that's OK. The key is when you mess up is to ask for forgiveness. Because that's what a real dad does. Oh and the jokes. Got any new ones? Yeah, did you hear the one about the pizza? It's probably too cheesy. Don't forget about the cake. All right, well, hey, let's just thank the Lord for all of our dads. Happy Father's Day, guys. We appreciate you more than you realize. We are so thankful for you, and I hope today will be an encouragement to you. Uh, the word, I do have some application from the passage this, today to dads uh, in particular, but I just know on Father's Day and Mother's Day, you, you come and you're bearing the weight of that responsibility, and I don't want to add to it. I want to help encourage you to lean upon Jesus. I know as a father and as, a, as a, just a man, to, to live this life uh, cannot be accomplished in my own strength and my own wisdom and so I want to point you to the one who gives us that. And I just want to express my thanksgiving for my own father and uh, the men that have influenced me in my life. And I know that families, you're taking time today, hopefully, to encourage uh, those guys uh, that uh, help bring you into this world. And so encourage them, love on them, lift them up today. We have just an epidemic of fatherlessness in our nation the United States leads the world in fatherless homes. Uh, it's hard to believe that as much as we stress the importance of family. Um, we lead the world in that category. And we know that it just it influences the, the next generation negatively in many, many ways. And I don't have to walk through those statistics to encourage you uh, or to talk to you about that. Uh, but what I want to do is just let you know that your presence, even if you're not perfect, your presence is such an incredible value in all of our lives. And so I just want to uh, ask you right now, if you're, you're a father, uh, grandfather, if, if that's a part of your life right now, uh, I want you to stand. 
uh, just wherever you are, I want to embarrass you. Let's just stand. Guys, stand with me. Uh, and let's take a moment just to encourage them. Would you give them a round of applause? Thank you, dads, for all that you do. I never saw such a group of uh, hesitant people looking at me. Thanks, but we really appreciate you, and we want to encourage you today. We're also, you see the set. We're getting ready for really one of the biggest weeks of the year. This is Vacation Bible School, and I know the kids are excited about it. I want to thank, really, we have hundreds of volunteers that are making this happen, uh, and our children's ministry, they're, they're helping drive this and putting this together. I think John probably painted this whole thing back here with his artistry and uh, put that together. So we're grateful for you. We want to take a moment as we pray for our dads. We also want to pray uh, for this coming week because we see every year we see children come to know Jesus. And this is, a, this is an incredible window of opportunity. And so we don't want to waste that. We want to take advantage of that by offering this kind of ministry. Thank you for letting us make that possible. And let's make sure we pray together that uh, we'll see fruit of changed lives, transform hearts through all that happens this week. Would you join me? Let's pray together. God, together we come and we thank you for our dads. And Father, I know that on a day like today, sometimes that brings pain and hurt. I know there are people here that probably have lost their fathers. Their fathers have passed away recently. Or maybe they didn't have a father and it brings a source of pain or one that certainly wasn't perfect. And God, that's why we turn to you. We turn to you as our heavenly father. We look for your leadership in our own lives as dads. And God, we look for your leadership in our lives as that father maybe we never had. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you come and you forgive us, you strengthen us, and you enable us to live the kind of life you've called us to live as parents, as leaders in our homes. And God, speaking of homes, we just pray for those homes that are bringing their children right here this week. We just pray that this would be holy ground as they hear the gospel, as they, uh, as they have fun and enjoy this time together, but most importantly, that they would come to know Christ. We look forward to seeing what you're going to do uh, well, I thank you for my leadership and my, my volunteers that are showing up tomorrow in all sorts of ways. God, thank you for their time and their effort. I pray that you'd bless them, give them great energy and strength as they make it through this uh, challenging week. But God, it's worth it because we get to tell these families, these homes, and these children about Jesus. We pray that you'll be honored and glorified through all that is said and all that is done this week. And we ask it together. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's continue in an attitude of prayer this morning, church. As we hear the word of the Lord this morning from Psalm chapter 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, and according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned. I've done what is evil in your sight. So you are justified in your words. You are justified in your judgment of me, O Lord. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness again, and let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, Take not your spirit away from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Deliver me from my guilt, O God, of my salvation. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. 
So as we hear the words of this psalm this morning, we're about to sing a song called Give Us Clean Hands. And it, it says just that. Lord, give me clean hands. Create a pure heart within me. Do you have any, any burdens walking in here, church? What's weighing on your heart? What's keeping you from being broken before God? I encourage you as we sing this song, this altar is open. If you have a burden, come and leave it here at this altar. Ask God to give you clean hands and a pure heart now as we sing. Would you stand with me? And as you do, this altar is open. Please come. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not Lift our souls to another. You know, God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face. Oh, God of Jacob. Oh, God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face. Oh, God. Jacob. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees, oh Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from our idols now, we turn our eyes oh. from evil. Oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not, let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not. Lift our souls to another, and oh God, let us be a generation that sees, that sees your face, oh God of Jacob, oh God, let us be a generation that sees, that sees your face. Oh, God of Jacob, oh, give us clean air, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Lord, give us clean air, give us pure hearts. Seeks your face, oh God of Jacob. And oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face, oh God of Jacob. That seeks your face, oh God of Jacob. Jacob, give 
give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, and let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, sing it out, let us not, not lift our souls. Oh God, let us be, oh God, let us be a generation that sees, seeks your face. Oh God, shake up, oh God, let us be a generation that sees, seeks your face. Oh God. seeks your face oh God we seek you now we seek you oh God Jacob Lord that's our desire break our hearts before you Lord God that we might be able to bring a sacrifice of praise that is pleasing. Lord, you don't want us just to present even our best before you, God. What you truly want is our broken, our humble, contrite hearts. So whatever you must do, Lord, Lord, I pray that you would break our hearts, that we might be able to worship you in spirit and in truth, that we might truly seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lord, I pray that you would use, use this time and use your word as we look to it now to bring us closer to you Lord I pray over our homes over our fathers and our families that we would build up a generation that seeks your face oh God we seek you I ask all these things in Jesus name Well, take your Bibles, folks, and let's, uh, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5, and I think that song really is the hope of what the Lord Jesus is doing in this passage and in the Sermon on the Mount as he's wanting to raise up a new community, a new people, a new generation that rightly understands uh, what a relationship with the God of Israel looks like, and they had misunderstood it, they had misconstrued it, they had mishandled the Word of God. And so what he's doing in the Sermon on the Mount is he's hoping to come and help them see uh, what true righteousness is. And to do that, he's going to confront today, and throughout the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, he's going to confront false righteousness. So you're going to see this as we walk through uh, this next part of the series out of the Sermon on the Mount. And we've, we've framed it, we've titled this section, this series, you've heard it said, <laughs> right? But I say to you. And so all through this, what, what Jesus is doing is he's helping tear down what, is, what they falsely built, self-righteousness, and build up and show them uh, what true righteousness is all about. Now, I hope, I hope you're excited to find out what that is. I hope that you enjoy uh, reading the Word of God and learning more about it, and I want to encourage you in it today. Here's what Jesus is trying to do. He's on a mission. He has been sent from the Father to seek and to save those who are lost, to call out uh, a people for his own possession, to call out people who will follow him and who will be in right relationship with God. He's tried to build, and in different places he calls it a home, a household. 
He says, I'm, I'm gathering the household of faith. And you and I, as dads in particular, have that same mission. And I know if you're a father and you're here at church this morning, probably you have this, you share this mission with Jesus and you share this mission with your pastor. And that is, we hope to see our home, our household, become a a people of faith, a household that will not only have greater peace and, 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 and uh, lead, leading of the Holy Spirit in this life, but will also be a family fit for the kingdom of God and for heaven. How many of you, how many of you would love to see your household fit for heaven? Raise your hand. All right, so I'm just seeing a bunch of people that are going to agree. We need to know this. We need to walk through this and understand that Jesus is on this mission, and so whatever he does to make his household, which includes you and I, fit for heaven, you and I can duplicate that. We can't do exactly what he did, but we can follow this pattern and bring what Christ has done for us into our household, and that's, that's my hope and encouragement for you today. It's entitled, Building a House Fit for Heaven, and that's what I want and I know that's what you want. In fact, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, there's this wonderful passage that I love. And it's kind of a warning, but it's also an invitation. At the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, it's chapter 7. We'll get there one day. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 says this. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Some of y'all are familiar with this story. And then he goes on and says, And the rain fell and the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because that household had been founded on the rock. And that's his illustration. And then he says, But everyone who hears these words of mine, you've heard it said, But I tell you, if you hear these words, what I'm telling you, and how I'm going to show you what the Old Testament really means and how I'm going to fulfill it for you. If you build your life and your household upon this, you're going to be like a man who builds on art. But if you don't, you're going to be like a man, a foolish man, who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. There's a storm coming. There is a judgment coming. You and I face a degree of that every day. We live under the brokenness of sin in our world, and we, we kind of live under just that part of God's judgment. And we want our homes to be able to withstand the cultural assaults. And the assaults and the temptations of this world, they're great, and they're great upon you dads in so many ways. We're battling the storm just in everyday life. And then ultimately, death brings us straight before the judge, our heavenly father. And if we're alive when he comes back, we're going to face that. And so we want a household that is fit for that. Now, Jesus is going to begin to challenge some of what people, he, he's really going to challenge throughout this sermon the foundations of the house that most of the Israelites had been building. And he's going to tell them that the houses, this, um, this belief structure and this way of doing life that, brings you, that you think is pleasing God and going to get you to heaven and make you fit, you have actually built it on sand. And so he's going to come, and I may use the word deconstruct today because this word in particular has become fashionable in our community and in our world. People's faith is deconstructing. And we see people who are abandoning their faith. Well, deconstructing has become a, a sad thing nowadays. But it is actually what Jesus is doing in a particular way he wants to deconstruct their false faith so that he can reconstruct true faith. And the true faith is exactly what we want you to hold to and that God wants us to hold to. And it is, it is built upon the rock of God's holy, authoritative word. 
and it is a built upon the work of Jesus Christ on the cross through his life and through his resurrection and through the gospel. And we want it built on that and so that the least bit of wind will not cause our young people and our children as they grow up to deconstruct and fall apart. In this world, a lot of it's happening because it was, these were lives and these were uh, uh, religious lives that had been built on sand rather than on truth. And so as fathers, we need to know and understand true righteousness found through Christ and through the teaching of his word. And we need to lay that foundation so that, so that and, and, and in, if in doing that, we may discover, men, that we have fabricated a type of faith for our family that needs to be cleaned off first. Some of you have bought property, and you didn't want the structure on the property, you just wanted the property. I know that happens at the beach a lot. Some of you may have done that, because it's the property that's worth something, right? And so, when we were, uh, we were looking at a piece of property to put a church on when I was pastoring in Virginia, the problem with this piece of property, it was perfect property. It was 20, 30 acres right on a main road. The problem with this one piece of property, and the property was going to Jeep. The problem was it had a giant old hospital full of asbestos on it. The property you could get for a couple hundred thousand dollars, tearing the hospital down took a couple of million dollars. So we just couldn't do that. There, there's things that are constructed sometimes in your family and in your life and in your thinking that need to be torn down because they're not built on the rock. And so Jesus, is. this is his process. He's going to confront it. You have heard it said, or maybe you said to your kids, or maybe your dad said this to you, but I say to you, build your house on that. So say amen if you're following me so far. All right, so that's what the Sermon on the Mount is really going to do. And this first passage that he uses is rather shocking. It's rather shocking because it's not what we would ex have expected. Sometimes people will say that Jesus was a real radical. He was bringing in new teaching. He wasn't bringing in new teaching. He was bringing in the old teaching and tearing apart the False teaching that had been added and stacked on top of it. So look at Matthew 5, 17. He says this. Do not think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. What's the law and the prophets? Well, the, the, the Jews of that day thought of the law and the prophets in this way. There, there's certainly the Ten Commandments, the kind of the center of it. And then there was the five books of the Pentateuch, the Torah, that would have been called the law. And then there was the prophets, Ezekiel, Isaiah, all the minor prophets, major prophets. And so they had a text, really our Old Testament is what they would have been thinking of when he said the law and the prophets. So Jesus begins with a full-hearted endorsement of God's Word, the Old Testament. Friends, be careful before you throw out something out of the Old Testament. Understand Jesus endorsed it. Listen to what he said. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth passes away, not an iota, not a dot will pass away from the law until it is accomplished. He says, I'm not here to abolish it. I'm actually going to fulfill it, and I'm going to accomplish the Old Testament. In fact, look at verse 19. If you relax any one of the least of these commandments, and then teach others to do the same, you'll be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. This would have been a popular thing. They actually, the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees had, had ordered the commandments in levels of importance. They were the greatest of the commandments and the least, and Jesus did that to a certain extent. He taught, they asked him, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart. And he was saying, if you do that, it kind of covers all of those things. But he says, he kind of uses this as a play with them. He says, if you relax even the one that you think is the least important commandment, if you relax that, you are not in God's will. 
So Jesus did not come to take away the truth of the Old Testament. He came to uncover it and return people back to it. And he shocks them with this verse right here. Look at verse 20. He says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, unless you actually are more righteous than the most righteous people you know, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Who's the most righteous person you know? Maybe it's that person sitting beside you. Maybe it's a, a grandparent. Maybe it's Billy Graham. Maybe you've got somebody in view. You know who the people of Israel would have had in mind when Jesus said, who are the, who's the salt and light of Israel today? They would have said, oh, that's easy. That's the Pharisees. And maybe even the Essenes. They were trying to outdo the Pharisees. They were living in these monasteries out just bathing a couple times a day and just trying to be completely separated from society. They would have looked to these Pharisees and, and, and others and said, oh, they're the most righteous because they're keeping all the rules. And Jesus comes in with a statement that is, obvious, is confusing to them. What do you mean? They're the top. They're the top of the top. They're the best of the best. I can't outdo a Pharisee, and many of them didn't want to try. He says, oh, your, your righteousness exceeds, it's got to exceed it. So Jesus, as you can see, in this early part of the Sermon on the Mount, is getting to something. He says, you need to be the salt and light of Israel. I'm creating a new household, a new people, and I'm going to help you become salt and light. And then they would say, well, uh, tell us how to do that. And he says, well, you're going to have to be better than the scribes and the Pharisees. What? How can I do that? Well, that's what this sermon is about, this entire sermon on the Mount. So I want to break it into two things. I want to see the Lord's mission that he's on and how he does it here to develop a people fit for heaven. And then I want to talk about our mission as parents real briefly. But let's look at his mission. Number one, you need to understand Jesus supports heaven's demand for righteousness. He expects true righteousness. And what was true righteousness? He pointed to it. He said the law and the prophets. What you see in the Old Testament, he says, I'm not doing away with that. This was God's expectation. And if you love God, don't you want to do what he expects of you? Some of you are going to do some things for your dad today you don't normally do because you love him. <laughs> it's Father's Day. I'll clean my room. Praise Jesus. I'll mow the grass. Oh, I needed you yesterday. If you love God, what, what does God expect? I want to do it. He says, I endorse the Old Testament. Jesus supports that. Then second of all, here's what he begins to do. This is how he accomplishes his mission. He says, I'm going to begin to tear down man's substitute for righteousness. I'm going to tear down these substitutes. I'm going to do away with the false sense of righteousness. So that's, that's letter B. So I'm going to support the truth of God's word, but I've got to do some uh, explanation of what true righteousness is. Now, how does he do that? Well, I've already mentioned a couple of things. He had to tear away some of the things that had been added. Now, what had been added? Well, I mentioned the three things they knew were the law, the Ten Commandments, the, the Torah, and then the, uh, the entire Old Testament, but then they would have added uh, thousands, literally thousands of regulations that the scribes had come up with. And why did they come up with thousands of extra regulations to put on top of it? Most of it was oral tradition until later on they wrote it down in common, commentaries, basically the Mishnah and Talmud. These things were collections of all of these extra rules. And why did they need that? Because they were frustrated that God had not been more specific in his commands. He said, uh, you are to rest on Sabbath. Well, what does rest mean? God never intended us to, to distrain that like a gnat. He said, you just rest from work. Well, how much, what is considered work? Well, they came up with hundreds of laws to describe what is work, what work is. And they created this, and, and the reason is, is because if you build this, this uh, framework of laws, you can check them off and say, well, I've accomplished the task. 
Let me just read some of these. They're funny and yet sad at the same time. What does it mean to carry a burden? You should not carry a burden on the Sabbath. What is a burden? Well, they decided it was food equal in a weight to a dried fig or enough wine for mixing in a goblet. Barclay writes this in his commentary, and he says it was milk enough for one swallow. (laughs) Don't take two swallows. That's a burden. You just do one at a time. Or honey enough to put upon a wound, oil enough to anoint a, a finger, water enough to moisten an eye salve, paper enough to write a customs house notice, ink enough to write two letters of the alphabet. So stop writing. Then it went on and on. They spent endless hours, he says, in his, he says, arguing whether a man could or could not lift a lamp from one place to another on the Sabbath, whether a tailor committed a sin if he went out and, and had a, one of his needles stuck in his robe because that would have been carrying a burden. Did you know they debated whether a woman might wear a brooch or even a wig, or if a man might go out on the Sabbath with dentures or an artificial limb. You see what Jesus is coming? He's saying, listen, you have built this facade of of all of these things on top of true righteousness. You've built a facade that will give you a sense of righteousness that is full of holes. It will not stand. And the Pharisees were living it out. And they were, that's why they were so mad at Jesus. Because he wasn't obeying all of their man-made traditions. And they were pointing at him and said, listen, you're not supposed to eat with those people. You're not supposed to do that. And Jesus says, you've just heard that said, but I'm here to tell you. And I'm the author of the book. I say to you. And what I'm going to tell you is not going to relax it. It's going to tear away that false get to the bottom and of the law and the prophets. And then when you look at the law and the prophets, here's what's going to happen. You're going to look at the Ten Commandments, and you're going to look at that, and even when you take away the thousands of extra, extra regulations, you're going to find that what is left is absolutely impossible to keep. And it condemns you. So I don't want you to to waste your time on self-righteousness and think you can walk around saying, well, I've not swallowed more than two. No, I've only had one thing of milk in my mouth today. I'm good. No. Here's what he did. Look at verse 21. We'll give you the first of six examples that we're going to walk through over the next few weeks. He says, you have heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Amen. Has any of you murdered anybody recently? No confessions? I don't think probably any of us have murdered anybody. That's intentional taking of life. And we might think, well, at least I've got one of the commandments down. Check. Then Jesus says, but you missed the point. This law was to point to a heart attitude. I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. You mean I, my words reveal my heart and the condition of my heart is the, I, I have the heart of a murderer. Even if I haven't murdered people and I'm going to be held accountable for what's going on inside? Yes. Yes. And so he begins to challenge them in this false righteousness. We were out in Los Angeles for the convention. Sarah and I took a few days, and we toured around these places. There's not really any reason to go out there often, so we took advantage of it. And we were walking along, and I looked out at the ship, and I recognized we were in Long Beach, and I recognized a ship. It was the Queen Mary, and I'd heard the Queen Mary was out there. I didn't know a lot about it, but it's been there since 1967, And it's been a tourist spot, and people can go on and look around. And so I took a picture of it, of course, and um, I I had read about it. And one of the things I'd read about it is that it's a continual nightmare to keep it afloat because it's rusting. 
And as I looked it back up to confirm some of what I thought, they've actually closed the Queen Mary for all of 2022, and the town of Long Beach took over the project, and they're spending millions of dollars to repair rust. What they found is they'd go around the ship, different places, and it, it had a nice paint job. They'd stick their finger in the paint job, and it'd go through. There's no metal. So years and years and years of mismanagement, they would put paint on top of rust, and they just couldn't keep up with the rust, and so you have a ship that's full of holes going nowhere. And I think that's what Jesus is looking at, this pharisaical faith and saying, it's a ship. It's got nice paint on it. It looks good, but it's full of holes. It will sink. It's going nowhere. In my prayer, that's not your faith. A faith built on self-righteousness. And Jesus said things like, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you are like whitewashed, what? Tombs. You look pretty on the outside, but inside is full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. And the answer the Sermon on the Mount gives is, You can't just put on another layer of paint and say, and keep the, the sign on it and pray, Kingdom people. Doesn't matter what you painted on it. And how good it looks, it's what, is there any metal left to the true faith? Is there anything under it? And so he begins to tear it down and rebuild it. He says, you've heard it said, but I say to you. You've heard it said, but I say to you. Six times, and we'll see that as we walk through. And by the way, Jesus uh, said, I've come to fulfill that righteousness. So Jesus um, endorses he expects the righteousness. He explains the righteousness. But here's the great thing about this text. Look at verse 20. Verse 17 is that Jesus comes and enables true righteousness. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Truly, I say to you, Folks, this is why they were so angry at Jesus, the religious elite, because when you, when you come in and say, I'm going to fulfill the Old Testament, here's, here's several things he was saying. Number one is he says, I'm here to really explain it. That's part of what fulfilling it. I'm going to explain it to you. Number two, the prophecies that are in it, I'm going to meet those prophecies. I'm going to fulfill those prophecies. And then he says, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to tell you what it means for your life. Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets in two ways. He did it by living perfectly the life of obedience that the written word of God demanded. And second of all, he fulfilled it by paying the penalty for all the people who did not obey the law of the Old Testament. Think about the majesty of that statement. Jesus fulfilled the standard of righteousness in two ways. He lived it, and he paid the penalty for it. He covered both sides of the equation. And then he comes and he says, not only am I going to live it perfectly, and pay the penalty as if I didn't, and offer that covering and that substitute for you. He says, I'm also going to come inside of your heart and enable you to live it. This was in the Old Testament the whole time. They just couldn't see it because they were blinded by self-righteousness and man-made religion. They couldn't see it. Look what he says in verse 26 of Ezekiel 36. You've heard this from me. He says, and I will give you, this is God's promise through Ezekiel in the Old Testament. Israel, I'm going to give you a new heart, not a new paint job. And I'm going to give you a new spirit. I've got to do that. That's what's required is heart righteousness. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit 
within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. That's why in Romans chapter 8, Paul is ecstatic and he's celebrating. He says, there is therefore, because of what Christ has done for us through his life, his death on the cross, and now putting his spirit in us, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are where? In Christ Jesus, you're not in the Queen Mary full of holes going nowhere. You're in Christ Jesus, and it's solid. It's the solid rock. You place your faith in him, and there's no condemnation. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The question is, which ship are you on? Where have you built your house? We need a new heart. <laughs> I used this illustration last message and in between services. It's funny how people hear this, but I'm going to tell it anyway. So I'm out in California and driving around places like L.A. and Santa Monica and all these places. You know, I saw more Teslas than I've ever seen in my life. I mean, there were electric cars everywhere. Everybody out there wants an electric car. It's green energy. There's Teslas everywhere and uh and i thought that was pretty interesting and i kind of expected they're known for uh that progressive uh liberal stance on a lot of things out there but here's what was so shocking to me is we were always trying to avoid the highways and so the ways was taking us different ways we kept going by the strangest thing is in the middle of tesla land there's a gigantic right in the middle of la there's a huge oil field With these things, you know, the pumping things like you see out in Texas? It was the oddest thing. I was walking through, and there's this thing. I I did a little research. It's four miles long. It's been there for like 100 years. It's been pumping oil. It's one of the biggest in our country. It's been pumping oil right in the middle of Teslaville. And I thought, this must really irritate all these folks that drive by it. Every day. They're trying to say, I'm doing green energy and I've got a new, new car. And look at them. They're still pumping all that stuff. I just thought that was funny. But anyway. <laughs> then, of course, it just made perfect sense to what Jesus has done for us. <laughs> You're saying how? How? The heart you're born with runs on self-righteousness. It runs on the things of this world. It loves to feed its own pride. Our engine, as it is, doesn't want to follow God. Our engine wants to follow the flesh. It's designed that way. We can't get pure enough fuel out of this world to help us run clean. We need total transformation. We need a new engine, a new heart, and that can only come through Jesus. One that doesn't run on self-righteousness and pride and the things of this world, but a heart that runs on the Spirit. You talk about clean energy. Run on the Spirit. That's the only way. That's the only way. And if you are, you're going to feel odd. You're going to be driving around the oil fields of this world every single day. And you're going to see everybody trying to burn the fuel of this world and live this world. And they'll be pumped full of pride And when things are going their way. And it's going to be tempting to you. And you say, no, listen, I'm going to run on Jesus. I'm going to build my home and my life on that rock and he's given me a new heart that can run on him you must receive that dads that's your mission for your home you need a home that runs on Jesus to be fit for heaven they need to see a dad who's running on Jesus You need to, like Jesus, have a greater vision for your role as a parent. Let me just give you a few applications. 
On your mission, dads, have a greater vision than just providing the sustenance, providing the food and the money and the vacation and the protection. Make sure your vision is way beyond that. You want salt and light produced in your home and from your home. You want to see the community of God developed in your home. Make sure, like Jesus, dads, you don't. Maybe you verbally support and honor the Old Testament and the New Testament as God's word, but make sure your life is honoring what you say you believe. Honor the truth of the scriptures in your home. So develop a greater vision. Honor the authority and trustworthiness of scripture. Thirdly, I have to do this. And I know if I have to do it, we all have to do it. I must continually pursue and communicate an accurate understanding of God's Word because it is so easy for us to pile stuff on it. Well, you know, such and such told me such and such, and this is kind of what I heard. Be careful not to build stuff. And so you have to be able to discern, and you see Jesus do this, and here's what he does. He puts the Spirit in you to be able to discern and say, no, that's man-made. That ain't real. It sounds good, but I'm telling you, that's not, that's not right. Here's what Jesus says. Are you able to say to your family, here's what Jesus says. I know I have to continually be growing and learning my understanding of Scripture. And I want to do that because I'm in charge of helping build a household fit for heaven. And then fourthly, I can't do it on my own and neither can you. And so just encourage you, abide daily in Jesus. You must run on Jesus you must abide in him who enables you to model that true righteousness. And can I tell you, just tell you what true righteousness looks like a lot of times in the Chauncey family and in this, this man's life as a father, sometimes the true righteousness is looking at my kids and saying, forgive me. I have failed you. That is not honorable before God. And I was not right. Did you know forgiveness and mercy is part of the gospel? Model that. Don't just slap on a fresh coat of paint and say, look at me, I'm perfect. By the way, they can see through that. <laughs> but continually grow and abide and, and let, let your family see you seeking Christ in what you do and in who you are. And let me just one final thing with when you're parenting children and young people, and I had a, I had a, I, I think you have to be careful. No matter how many kids you have, you get into behavior control. No, stop, do that. I want them to act a certain way and be a certain way, and that is your job to a certain degree: is to help them have manners and to see how to live life and what not to do, teach them right from wrong, and then you discipline. I, I, I preach sermons on that. I'm not saying you shouldn't discipline and set standards in all those ways, but your ultimate goal, Dad, is not behavior control. It's heart transformation. And to do that, lead your family to Jesus, the rock. Let's pray. With every head bowed and just a time of reflection, dads, I hope I didn't add more weight. Jesus comes with this and he says, listen, I give you my, a new heart, a new engine, then I put my spirit in you to enable you and help change you and help transform your heart, and even if you're not there yet, I'm with you to help you become more Christ-like. That is the amazing God. That you and I have the privilege of knowing is a God who doesn't just look at us and shame us for being 
imperfect dads, but comes along with us, in us, to help us grow and become. He'll do work through you. You never see maybe this side of heaven. So abide in him daily. And let him just create in you that clean heart. And let him lead through you. But I, I just encourage you, dads, pursue Christ each and every day. But everyone who is here, including you dads, I don't know if this message, if the Holy Spirit spoke to you today and you are concerned that you have a, a faith that is built on the wrong things. Maybe it's stuff, your own opinion. Maybe your faith is a combination of some of what you like out of the Bible and some of what you've come up with. I hope the Holy Spirit has showed, has, has revealed to you that that ship is full of holes and it's rusting and it will not float. And the scripture gives you a way out of that. You must just repent. You just leave that ship and you turn to Christ. You repent of your sin and you come to Christ. And maybe some of you here today need to repent of, of believing in something other then the work of Christ on the cross for you, his resurrection, his life, his perfect life. If you've been trusting in anything else, I just encourage you right now, you've got to repent of that and place your trust fully in Christ. I encourage you every Sunday to just pray, just turn to him. It says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you'll call upon him, no matter what condition you think you're in, you call upon him. He rescues you. He takes you. He get, you are born again in him. He brings you in and he replaces that old engine with a new one. And then he abides with you. You abide with him. Would you trust Christ as your Savior this morning if you hadn't? And I invite you when we stand and we sing, and I would love to know about that. I'm going to be down here to the side. We're also going to have prayer partners I'd love for you to come talk to one of them and let them pray for you. Celebrate that. And if you need to be baptized, and you do, following belief comes baptism. Let us, let us move you towards that. If some of you have been believers for a while and need to be baptized, it would be a great time to say that. But listen, I would love everybody today, especially if you're a dad, if you want to come and pray at this altar, it's a great time just to say, God, help me to be the Father that only you can be through me that I can only be in you. Help me lead my family well. And maybe you're here struggling. You're a single mom. You're a single dad. Well, we'd love the honor of just praying for you and all that challenge that you have. It's not easy, and we know that. We want to come alongside of you any way we can. If you need prayer in any way, you come. I'll be out in the foyer after the service as well. Our prayer partners will be here. If you've got anything you'd like to share, listen, we're here for you, however God's spoken to you today. Father, may we respond as you let us. May we say yes to whatever your question is, uh, whatever you're leading us to do. We just want to give our yes to you today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Would our prayer partners come as quickly as you can? You come down. And if you want to come pray, church, you come and pray. To Jesus, I surrender in all to Him. I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior and I surrender all all 
to Jesus I surrender and humbly at his feet I bow worldly pleasures all forsaken take me Jesus take me now I surrender all I surrender all All to Thee, my blessed Savior I surrender all Amen, church family. Would you give him praise in this place? We surrender all to you, Jesus. We lay all of this before you. Thank you all for, so much for being here. Happy Father's Day. Be blessed as you go. All right, I'm going to have a repeat after me. Here we go.